Hey, how's it going? My name is Sean, and today I'm going to show you how to use the animation feature in Clue Studio Paint EX for the iPad, specifically, because it's quite similar to the desktop version, but without the use of keyboard shortcuts and with a limited screen size, the workflow is a little bit different, so I think it warrants its own video. So I've been animating uh, professionally and, and designing for about six years, and in that time I've used a bunch of programs, Toon Boom Harmony, Flash, Photoshop, TV Paint, Cell Action 2D, and I've also used uh, a few um, animation programs for the iPad. I've just kind of messed around with Rough Animator, uh, Flip Pad, Procreate. They're all grand, but I haven't used them too extensively because Clip Studio Paint is my absolute favorite. Once I started using it for animation, I didn't want to use anything else, and I wanted to tell everyone I knew about what it could do because I was like surprised and impressed by just how robust the animation function is. It's really good. And uh, I figured, you know, while I'm in the middle of a scene, I might as well record this now while it's all kind of fresh in my mind. Playback can be a little bit choppy, depending on how big your scene is. Uh, this scene's like pretty big, so I have to account for that camera move at the start. Basically, this is Spider-Man in training. He's wearing a very basic and easy to animate costume without any webbing. He uh, tries to throw a bin at someone, but he ends up tripping and throwing it over himself. I don't think this scene will be finished by the time I'm done with this tutorial, but uh, I'll finish it pretty soon afterwards and I'll upload it to my channel. So I'll put a link in the description if you wanna go watch it. Um, but I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later because I wanna use it as an example. So I wanna show you my workspace. I wanna show you a couple of shortcuts that I've set up. And then I wanna show you how the animation function works. And hopefully you'll see why those shortcuts are useful and where and how I use them. Right, so this is my workspace. I've got everything uh, laid out where I like it. I really thought that I could restore it to the default view that you see when you open up Clip for the first time, but it actually didn't let me do that. And that sucks because I really wanted what was on my screen to be the same as what you see on yours. I thought that would be the easiest way to follow along. Uh, the nice thing is like Clip is so customizable that you can, you know, set things up exactly as you want it. And the first thing that I would do is just start to delete panels that you don't want and find a place for the stuff that you do. As you can see, I like to keep my layers uh, visible at all times. I've got tools and then this quick access panel of shortcuts. You, you'll figure it out. This works for me, but you know, you'll uh, you'll figure out what you like best. All right, so when you've got that set up and laid out all nicely, we're gonna create a new scene and you do that by coming up to file, new, and then come into this play button. A lot of this is self-explanatory, so I'll go through it uh, quickly. You can name your file, set the size of your canvas. You can add a title safe area if you want one. I don't know what overflow frame is. I've looked it up. I've read descriptions. I've messed with it. Can't figure it out. I've never needed it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but this is very cool. You can add blank space around your canvas that will not render when you save out an image sequence. And that's handy, for example, if you have a character walking in uh, off, from off screen, you can pose them out off screen and animate them on. And it just helps with figuring out the timing making it feel more natural, I think. I've struggled in TV Paint version 10 without that feature, uh, so I think that's really great. And then, yeah, just make sure your frame rate is set properly, and then we hit OK. So by default, a new scene will have a white paper layer and an animation folder. An animation folder is different to these regular folders that you're probably familiar with. You can see that the symbol for this regular folder is like a normal paper folder and the symbol for this animation folder I think looks like a stack of animation paper. Um, so a regular folder groups together different layers of artwork. So maybe all of your BG layers, for example. So there's not gonna be animation there. It's just like a uh, artwork that is held for the length of the scene. And an animation folder groups together all of your frames of animation. If you wanna add a new animation folder, there's a button here on the timeline. It looks like a stack of paper with a plus next to it. So that will add a new animation folder, or you can come up to animation, new animation layer, animation folder, that will add another one. Um, so you can see that we've got one frame here already. So uh, we've got a one on the timeline and a one in the layers panel. If I come down the timeline to frame nine, and I press the new frame button, which looks like a sheet of paper with a plus next to it, that is next to the new animation folder button. If I press that, it will create a second frame. So that is called two, and we can see here that a two has appeared in our animation folder. So now we have two frames, two images, two drawings in our sequence. 
So I'm going to start adding in some drawings to help you understand what's going on. But before I do that, I just want to show you some shortcuts really quickly. So I've got a shortcut panel up here with four shortcuts in it. Onion skin settings, rename in timeline order, insert frame and delete frame. And the reason that I have these four here and only those four is because they are incredibly difficult to find in the menus. I can't ever remember where they are. There isn't a single other feature that I use that isn't like immediately accessible somewhere here by a button, but these four are kind of hidden. So it just makes sense to uh, keep them in a panel here out in the open. So to create a set like this, you go to these three lines next to quick access and you go to create set and you can name it whatever you want. It'll come in uh, empty like this and then to add some shortcuts, you go to those three lines again, quick access settings, and then you find it in the menu. And the only reason I know where onion skin settings is it's because I have it written down next to me. So it's animation, show animation cells, onion skin settings. You hit add and then close it and you can see that it has been added to the panel up here. And let me just show you animation, show animation cells, onion skin settings. Having to do that every time you want to adjust it, it's no good. Uh, so I just have it out here in the open. Oh, I should say if you've added something by accident, let's say uh, open page um, to delete it. Yeah, you just hold down on it again, come to delete. That's gone. So I'm going to animate like a really quick and terrible bouncing ball. <laughs> um, so for that, I will need onion skinning. And so on the timeline here, there is a button that looks like two squares overlapping. And so when you press that, that is onion skinning. When I come to frame two, you can see that there's like a ghost of frame one left behind. Uh, so there's our drawing for frame two. When I create a frame between frame one and frame two, clip will automatically call it 1A. When you create a frame between 1A and 2, Clip will automatically name that 1B. Wow. I don't think this is actually good, is it? Oh, maybe that's fine. Richard Williams would be proud of me. When you put a frame in between 1A and 1B, for example, uh, Clip will give it a name. In this case, it's layer 1. And so you can see how your timeline would quickly become disorganized and messy, right? I'll get to that in a minute. I'm building to something. There it is, folks. Four years of animation college. Uh, basically, now that I have multiple frames, I can show you how the onion skin settings work. So currently I have it set to show one drawing on either side of my current position. Uh, there you go, one. So I can change these numbers, let's say two. If I hit OK, now it shows me uh, two drawings on either side of my current position. I can also change those colors. In this case, I know that blue is the preceding frames and orange are the two frames that come after. And you know, it'll probably be pretty clear from your drawings anyway, um, but sometimes it gets a little hard to figure out and it's just another thing that helps to, to clarify what you're seeing. Uh, here's another tool that does that. You can set the opacity levels for each of these drawings. So the drawing closest to your current frame on either side will start at 40% opacity and then recede back to 10%. So there it is. It's like nothing groundbreaking in terms of onion skinning, but uh, I just thought it was surprisingly good for this type of program. Like Photoshop doesn't have anything close to this good, you know? Definitely not in the base model. Maybe you can get plugins. I don't know. I just think this is neat. <laughs> so I mentioned before I had a time I can get uh, messy quite quickly. So in this case, we have one, one A, layer one, one B and two. And that's where rename and timeline order comes in. So we're gonna add another shortcut up here, come to these three lines, go to quick access settings, and then navigate through the menus to find it. Literally, the only reason I know where that is, once again, is because I have it written down next to me. So it's animation, edit track, and then rename in timeline order. We can add that to our panel, close it, and we can see that it's been added up here. Basically what that does, uh, believe it or not, it renames things in the timeline in the order that they appear. So one, one A, layer one, one B, becomes one, two, three, four, and so on down the timeline. And that's just incredibly cool for keeping things organized and clean. So you've seen how single frames work in the timeline, and I'm gonna show you one of the coolest things about Clip Studio Paint, which is that you can link entire folders to a position on the timeline, not just single layers, single images. So I'm gonna delete this for sake of clarity. I'm gonna make a new animation folder that is uh, empty right now. There's nothing in the timeline, nothing in this folder. I'm gonna create a regular folder with this button and that creates folder one. And then I'm gonna add a couple of layers into that folder. I'm gonna call the bottom one uh, rough. Second one is color, for example. And the third one is line art. So there's a folder in this animation folder, a regular folder 
um, but the timeline still isn't showing anything. Basically, when you add a frame with this button, it's like the timeline knows about it. It appears on the timeline and it appears over here. But when you add something over here, you sort of have to tell the timeline it exists. And so to do that, we come to this button here, which is like a square with a chain link on it. You have to uh, link or assign that drawing a position on the timeline. So when we press that, we get a list of every frame that appears in that animation folder. The more you work into a scene, you know, this list gets longer, but in this case, there is only one frame. So I'll press OK. And now you can see I can draw on the line work layer. I can draw on the color layer and I can draw on the rough layer. So if I come down the timeline, the last time I showed you this, when it was just single layers, when I added a new frame, uh, it created a, a new layer called two. This time when I do it, it creates an entire folder that maintains the same uh, setup and naming structure as the folder that preceded it. And that is incredibly cool. If you want to do all your rough animation on these rough layers, uh, you can do that. And then you can clean up on your uh, cleanup layer and then, you know, turn off your rough layers. So I want to show you another example of where that comes in handy. So in this scene that I showed you earlier, I decided not to use any outlines. I just used blocks of color and I decided to use uh, just some lines where shapes of the same color overlapped. So, you know, the ear against the head and then his arms against the body. And so I decided to put literally every element onto its own layer. So I've got the brows, uh, his pupil, I got the bobble of his hat, his hat, the hat rim. Basically, I didn't know if these were the colors that I was gonna go with. And I just thought, okay, I'll put them all in different layers. That means I can change them all super easily. So I just separated it out. I think with digital tools like this, just use them to your advantage, you know, it's all about the end product and maybe some purists like wouldn't like that as a way of working, but I don't see why not. The uses for this kind of thing uh, are varied and vast and I just think it's such a cool feature. So the last two shortcuts I want to show you are insert frame and delete frame. And to add those, we go to those three lines again, quick access settings. Once again, no idea where they are. Uh, animation, timeline, we have insert frame add and delete frame add and so what they do is insert and delete frames either just on the layer that you're on or uh, in, across the entire uh, set of layers and so a good use for this might be in this scene here we have spider-man drop in the goon sees him he reacts and he runs out behind him is a bin spider-man looks to it he webs it obviously it's not finished tries to throw it um, but I think the way it's working right now is the animation is too close together. So this guy, the audience is following him. He doesn't even get off. Look, Spider-Man has started to turn from this point. This guy is still too on screen for this to be happening. So what needs to happen is this guy can get off screen. Uh, this animation needs to be shifted like six frames, eight frames, ten frames that way. So that the audience have time to see this guy leave, turn to Spider-Man, see the look to the bin and know what's about to happen next, right? So it's my job to like make sure that people are looking in the right spot when I want them to be looking. And so the way I would do that, I think a, a, an easy way to do it is come up to insert frame. Uh, I'm going to say 10 frames and I am going to leave these two boxes unticked for now. Selected layers only will apply the change to the, the layer that you're on and nothing else, but I want it across the entire set of layers. So I'll hit OK. And I can see down here that everything has been shifted 10 that way. Except I want the goons animation to stay the way it was. So I can come to his layer, hit delete, key in 10. And in this case, I am going to leave selected layers only selected because I only want it to affect him. So I hit 10 and all of his animation that just went that way is back to where it was now. And now he's off screen. And then let me zoom in for uh, make that a little bit clearer. This guy is gone. The audience have turned their attention to Spider-Man. Now we see him look to the bin and then web it. And I just think it, you know, it'll make sure that the audience doesn't miss what's going on. So that's like a perfect use case for, for, for those shortcuts, I think. I love using this program, but there are a couple of things about it that aren't perfect. When you're animating on paper or on a computer, it's very easy to flick back and forth between keys, you know, to rough in a breakdown drawing in between the two. 
uh, whether that be physically rolling the paper or flicking back and forth with keyboard shortcuts, but there isn't really a perfect way to do that on the iPad. When I wanna scroll through the timeline, I do that by dragging my pen back and forth. And I wish that there was a reliable way to do that while keeping your pen hovering in the center of the canvas, like ready to rough in shapes, you know? And I say reliable because there kind of is a way that I figured out, but I just don't think it's very good. Clip has an edge keyboard. So if you drag in from the you know side of the screen, you'll see these keys. And then if you drag in from the other side, it'll get rid of it. It doesn't always work, but sometimes if you do it gently, it'll float. And if you do it a second time, it'll dock. Um, usually the first time I do it, it docks automatically if you do like a big enough swipe. These keys here are programmable. And so you do that by coming up to the clip logo in the top left corner coming down to uh, shortcut settings and then finding where, uh, you know, uh, previous and next frame is in the menus. In this case, it's animation, move frame. Uh, and so go to previous frame, you can edit shortcut and then touch T1 and T1 appears here. And if you go to uh, next frame, you can edit shortcut and hit T2 and that will appear there. And so you hit okay. And now uh, you can see in the timeline that these uh, two hotkeys are next frame and previous frame. But honestly, without the like tactile feel of real buttons and your focus like here on the center of the screen, you know, you don't always know that you're hitting these and it's, it's not like 100% reliable. So I don't know, that just doesn't really work. I've seen people get these uh, Bluetooth games controllers and map some shortcuts onto that. And I think that's great. I thought about getting one, I just haven't got around to it yet, but I think that's like, you know, I've, I've gotten used to navigating through the whole program without every other uh, keyboard shortcut, but I think that would be like a perfect use for that kind of thing, you know? My only other gripe is that currently you cannot import audio clips into the version for the iPad. And it would be incredibly cool to be able to use it to animate to dialogue and music. And I hope that's something that they implement in the future. I think you might be able to do that on the desktop version, but come here. After my day job in animation, if I want to animate at all, I don't want to be doing it at the same desk that I've sat at all day. I want to do it on the couch. I want to do it in bed. I used to animate in cafes with my friends all the time before the like global health crisis thing. You've probably heard something about it. I used to animate on the way to work on the bus. I used to animate on the bus coming home. Uh, I used to animate on the couch with my little dog sitting on my lap before I moved out of my parents' house. I just can't get over what you can do on something that thin. I think it's incredibly cool and the portability of it just makes up for all the other like mild inconveniences, you know? So listen, I hope you enjoyed that and I really do hope you learned something from it. I hope you feel like you have a good understanding of the basics and, and maybe some uh, shortcuts and, you know, stuff like that that might help you uh, make some cool stuff. If you like this video, maybe give it a thumbs up and, uh, you know, if you're not already subscribed, I would ask that maybe you consider doing that. I'll be back soon with something else. Uh, so yeah, cheers, thanks, thanks very much, take it easy.